that at the time they were both owned by the Dalai Lama. So you can imagine that was a very different place. It was a patriarchal society, as many medieval societies were, as societies still are. But we're in a world where women have equal footing in a country where we all have rights, in a world where there is the internet, where you can't keep many things secret. So it's a different time and place to be giving these teachings. And I felt after I graduated from my open teachings and what they call the secret teachings or higher advanced teachings of Buddhism, that uh, especially in the same line as, as my teacher, Lama Marut, who's so wonderfully independent in his thinking and who really, I've never experienced him teaching us anything that he hasn't really thought through himself. And he'll say at times, this, this is where I've arrived at so far, stay tuned. I may, you know, I may keep working this and be telling you something slightly different next year, but this is as far as I've gotten in my own thinking. So I thought that I would try to talk about my own experience in trying to take Lord Buddha's ideas into my own life. Mm. I found it was a great temptation as I began to create these classes to keep referring to other sources. And I have some beautiful things from other sources that I will read to you tonight. But what I'm hoping to do is to give you a sense of what I am experiencing. When I was growing up, I had a terrible, terrible sense of shame. I still have it, but not to the extent that I had it when I was young huge sense of shame, and when I would feel it, I would feel as if I had been thrown into the outer edges of the universe, and that I would have a very difficult time coming back. And out of, oh, can you hear me, Dimitri, at all? Have I said anything that was understandable? All right, sorry. All right, tell me if that's okay. And out of that shame, sense of shame came um, a good thing, which was a lot of compassion for other people. And the shame came mostly from having created an idea about who I was supposed to be and then falling short of it almost all the time, which is something that I think that we do. We have a tendency to do. And we can't relax around that constantly, especially in the universe we're living in right now on this planet, because so much is coming at us, because so much is available to us that we've never, ever had this kind of constant information, constant sharing of the world's miseries to this extent. I think we keep having a sense of helplessness. What can I do? What can I do? And accompanying that is a sense of shame. I'm not doing much. I'm really not doing much. What will I ever be able to do to help or to solve this? Or to even mm, step out of my house and go to work. What do I do? I used to love, uh, I, I come from the East Coast, and on the East Coast, of course, there are seasons. I know there are seasons out here, but I always say they don't count because <laughs> you know, the leaves don't <laughs> fall off the trees and you don't have six foot of snow in front of you. I know there are seasons here, though. And, but we have these extreme seasons made more extreme now by global warming. And in the fall, the geese would make these beautiful V formations and they would fly south. And many times you would only know that they were doing it by hearing them because there might be clouds overhead in the fall. But you'd hear the geese and you'd know that they were going south. And I used to cry as a young person when I heard the geese. And I asked myself, why is this so moving to me? And the answer came, because they know what to do. They know what to do. So last class, the first class of this series was about intimacy. 
And this class is about separateness. And one of the th points I want to make, which is a very Buddhist way of looking at it, is that they are the same thing. That we can't know intimacy unless we have a sense of separateness. They are interdependent. They arise together. So Buddha would also say about them that neither one of them is good or bad. And we know this. You know that you can get too intimate with someone and then have to pull back and create some sort of a boundary or whatever. Or we can have a deep sense of separateness, which actually at some point we get good and sick of, and it throws us into some new aspect of our life where we begin to make a connection with other people. So you can't really say. It, it sounds like, well, the first class was about this really sweet thing, and this class is kind of about this awful thing. But I'm not really looking at it like that. What I'm really interested in is what happens to us after we come to class like this, and we get in our cars and we go home. Something different happens to me. It's like I'm in another world. And I get very inspired in here. Or I kind of ride, I call it drafting on my teacher's wake. I kind of ride on a kind of energy and, and vitality that my teacher had. And you know, I feel, oh, yes, I'm going to be doing that. And I'm going to be thinking that. And I'm going to be interacting with people in a special way. And I'll be generous. And I'll be patient. And I'll be kind, of course. But I go home, and I'm sitting in my room in the morning trying to do this thing called meditate, and I'm agitated. I feel lost. I wonder what is the first thing I should be doing, what is the second thing I should be doing, etc. And I'm wondering whether I will ever get there at all, wherever that is, the goal of this path, whether I will be able to change whether I will be able to perceive things the way they say in scripture that you can once you've practiced a spiritual path for a long period of time. And then I sit staving off doubt, and then I gather myself together and I do something. And this morning before this class, I was really going to skip my meditation. I thought, well, I have so much to do. Because as usual, I had too much material. So my task today was really what not to teach you as well as what to teach you. And then I caught myself. I said, no, no, I'm going to meditate this morning. And I sat down, and I, I began to feel a sense of mm, connection when I closed my eyes. I didn't know who was coming tonight. There might have been one of you. There might have been 70 of you. I had no idea. But I felt a kind of interesting connection that there were people, as I was sitting down thinking of what to say, who were in some way preparing to join me tonight. And I hadn't even thought about that before. I hadn't really thought about who I was going to talk to. And I thought about you, and I thought about myself when I'm in your position and I'm going to go to a teaching. And I thought, what a special group of people must be coming tonight who are not you know, going to see Life of Pi or not going out for a drink with a friend or not staying home and being depressed or you know, any of the above and more, but you're coming here. And I felt a sense of um, gratitude to you. So I wanted to say that. And that really made me understand that the very first, I think, element of connection is gratitude. Is gratitude. I draw. And when I begin to draw, of course, when you're faced with a blank paper. It's a little bit daunting, right? And Van Gogh used to say, you know, throw paint on the paper, you know, hurl paint on the paper, drip paint out of the paper, by mistake, get paint all over the paper, whatever you do, but get something on that paper so it isn't so blank when you begin. 
And it's true that the first mark is the most dangerous mark, partly because you fall in love with it. It's the mark that you made on the paper, and you fall in love with it. And then, as the drawing begins to go further and further, and the drawing starts to emerge, that mark no longer belongs to the drawing. But you've fallen in love with it, and you don't want to let it go. I did a painting like this once where the first few marks I made were the mouth. I don't know why. They were the mouth of the person that I was drawing. And after a while, you know, the teacher stops the class and says, let's all look at each other's <coughs> drawings. And he said, I just want to point out the mouth on Lindsay's portrait is one of the best mouths that I've ever seen. You know, it's like, oh my God, you could just shoot yourself then, you know, because <laughs> you're not quite sure how you did it. <laughs> but then the drawing for the rest of the afternoon had to grow. And I was stuck with the best mouth that he'd ever seen, which didn't belong on that face anymore. See? It's hard to grow because it means we have to really be <laughs> in the place that we've derived at then, and everything else has to go. Everything else has to go. Okay? But when I start to draw, the one thing that I always feel I feel grateful for my entire life. It's not like I sit there thinking that, but I feel grateful for everything that I have to date that's going to come into my hand that's going to help me, all right? Create something beautiful or something that perhaps, I don't know, will help someone else live, all right? I'm grateful that something is in my hand already. So. One of the first things I want to say about gratitude is often when we're learning a spiritual path, we're kind of going from the bottom up, and it's a slog, you know? It's like a slog uphill. But I'd like to suggest that for these classes, anyway, we go from the top down, that we start with the fact that we are loved that we are loved. Not that we are lovable or that we are better than anybody else or whatever, but that love is the state of our being. It's the ground of our being. Has to be. The ground of our being can't be destruction. Or how could anything arise? It can't be destruction. It must be something good. It must be something good. We see good around us, a lot of good. That has to be a reflection of us. Because think about it this way. If we're born into a context, we're born into a certain family, in a certain place, at a certain time, and our ancestors came from certain countries, and they had their way, and that was taught to our parents, and then it's brought down to us. We go to Catholic school, or we go to shul, or we are Muslims, or we're Sufis, or we're people who have no religious affiliation, but we go to public school, or we go to private school, or whatever. Whatever our economic status is, there are all these influences. And we come into the world with these influences creating a kind of very special soup that we are, a, a, a snowflake, unlike any other snowflake, any other mushroom in the woods. So right away, we're a gift. We're a gift simply because there isn't anyone like us. There's no one like us. So we carry a particular sensibility, a particular perspective that no one else has. So we come in. Mm. let's say we establish by coming in, just by the act of coming into the world, the idea that we should be heard from, that we will have something to say, that we will have something to offer. And it seems to me you can't be a gift without something to give. You can't be a gift without something to give. Somewhere... We are loved. Somewhere we are loved. Okay. Mm. 
I asked um, some, some Buddhist deities today, Tara and Avalokiteshvara, uh, goddess and god of compassion, Lord Buddha, a bunch of wonderful deities to help me with this teaching. And I said, may I include everything that I think of from this minute on, when I asked this morning in my meditation. So the first uh, thing that happened was my little dog, Pushti, scratched on the door of my room. And I, at first I, I forgot my promise almost immediately, and I thought, this is an annoyance. I wonder what I should do. And then I remembered my deal with the deities, and so I opened the door to Pushti. And Pushti is about eight pounds, and he came in and he squirmed around really happily looking for me to pick him up. So I picked him up and I put him down on my little bed where I work and I rubbed his belly and flipped him over on his back and played with him. And I thought about who Pushti is. Why did the gods send Pushti in when I made this deal with him? Well, Pushti loves to lick everyone. And especially as we live in California, people wear sandals a lot. And as he's about six inches high, he has access to people's feet a lot. Anybody who comes in our house has a foot bath from Pushti. <laughs> you know, they say in India that when you give someone respect, you get down and you wash their feet when they come in. You know, it's one of the offerings we give to Buddha for the water bowls, water for the hands, water for the feet, to wash your feet. Because in India, the feet were dirty, they were dusty. So who is Pushti? He washes everybody's feet when they come in. He'll lick your foot under the table. He'll lick your hand if it's close to him. He loves to lick. And if you take your hand away or your foot away, he'll keep licking. He'll keep licking the air. <laughs> My husband calls him the cereal licker. <laughs> he's so excited to be alive that he just, he's like a little dog that keeps on giving. When you feed him, he jumps about a foot in the air, repeatedly, like a little rabbit. He's so excited over breakfast. And when I get up in the morning to feed him, he has an impact on me. He has an impact on me. He's so excited just to be there, getting his breakfast. <laughs> He's a reminder of innocence. So number one, gratitude. In any time that we're about to make any gesture at all, whether we're frightened, whether we're confident, wherever we're moving in the world, just try to call to mind gratitude for just being there. One, okay? You will feel a sense of connectedness. Two, remember we are all innocent. We are all innocent. And when you're innocent, there's always a sense of joy available to you. Any moment in time is completely fresh, completely open, completely uninfluenced by your ancestry, your culture, your education, your likes, dislikes, your prejudices. It's completely open. Often we bring with us this kind of filter that we place over everything. So our eyes are receiving information, the rods and cones are registering you know, shapes and colors and whatever, but immediately, boom, we hold out this filter of where we come from, what we like, what we don't like. Let's say we had an Uncle Harry, and Uncle Harry had beady, close-set little eyes, and he laughed too loud, and he had a funny way that he breathed, and he kind of snorted when he breathed, and you know, it, I just didn't like Uncle Harry growing up. I didn't want to be near him since I was a child, let's say. Now you are going to get an interview for work. And in walks a guy who has some characteristic of, boom, Uncle Harry. And there's Uncle Harry. And the man who walked in doesn't stand a chance. We're doing this all the time. The moment isn't fresh. We're just bringing in the repeat episode 